Hello and welcome to Bias Futures. We are reaching uh, the end of the festival and the conference. And maybe I quickly mention that in the last four days we have been looking into the um, alarming economic, social and political divides of our times, paying special attention to the role that media and technological systems play in their formation. Today, as it is uh, the last day of the conference, we are in a way speculating and reflecting upon how the future might evolve. So we examine how the new inscribed in the system's biases might affect tomorrow's society and which and whose values might respectively be prominent. The main idea behind this panel, Bias Futures, is to discuss the concerns about the changes that artificial intelligence might bring to cultures, territories and groups of people, and to respectively address the urge for political and uh, social counterfictions. And I shall say no more really, because the panel has been uh, curated and developed together with UC Parika as part of our ongoing collaboration with the Winchester School of Art. Uh, UC Parika is a writer, media theorist and professor at the Winchester School of Art, uh, University of Southampton and one of the founding directors of the new research group Archaeologies of Media and Technology. His books and articles have analyzed accidents and dark sides of network culture, as well as digital audiovisual culture. Among his books are the titles Insect Media, What is Media Archaeology, The Anthropocene, A Geology of Media, and Writing and Unwriting Media Art History, uh, this last one together with uh, Joyce Acrisia. UC Parika was uh, also one of the editors of the Transmediale 30th anniversary publication Across and Beyond, Post-Digital Practices, Concepts and Institutions, published last year, which you can still uh, get from uh, the info counter downstairs if you're interested. Um, thank you very much. Please welcome UC Parika and our speakers. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Daphne. Um, that was a lovely introduction. Um, good afternoon. I've got the pleasure to be moderating this wonderful panel with three lovely speakers, Anna Teixeira Pinto, Yukui, and Francis Hunger, who will engage with the topic of, as we just heard, biased futures. Um, one of the nice features about Transmediale is that by Sunday, um, and as we, as we, as we, I'm sure the ones who have been able to enjoy for the several days of transmediale talks and, and art and, and much more, that you see how things start to build up. A lot of the themes that we will engage, you've heard, heard already about in other panels. So you'll be able to make nice connections between various themes in the keynotes, the panels and other things as well. And hopefully we will be able to offer something new as well. I'm pretty sure we will. Um, I like the fact that the panel title is plural, to speak of futures, which signals still a relative openness as to what's to come. It's a sort of a machine learning in its own right, if you want to see it like that. What data sets determine what sort of potential things can emerge? What training sets are the infrastructure of an emerging future? Or in more cultural studies vocabulary, what sort of cultural patterns and practices Political affects, imaginaries, forms of subjectivity and power are indeed the framework through which life is being reproduced, but also being contested. And also, where geographically, geopolitically, and also institutionally, in which institutional contexts are those futures being determined and discussed? At a moment where many of these technologies that we will engage with and have been engaging with for days also are redrawing those geopolitical lines. So, for instance, the World Economic Forum in Davos finished just recently after featuring the usual lineup of governmental representatives, big business lobbyists, and other stakeholders. Among them, the British Prime Minister, Theresa May. She was discussing nothing less than AI, artificial intelligence, at a time when the popular enthusiasm for AI is pretty much matched by the corporate input as that meets up with geopolitical rhetorics, UK in its post-Brexit vote chaos wants obviously to stake its own claim in the field as part of projected near futures 
but relating to global flows of investment. Unfortunately, you do know that things are not really going well for you when even Wired is being sarcastic about your talk, reporting sarcastically about the context of your speech. Oh dear, Theresa May, whose talk was reported to have included these kinds of visionary phrases as, imagine a world, these are Theresa May's world, words, imagine a world in which self-driving cars radically reduce the number of deaths on our roads. Imagine a world where remote monitoring and inspection of critical infrastructure makes dangerous jobs safer. Imagine a world where we can predict and prevent the spread of diseases around the globe. And also pretty much a summary of her talk, AI can do great things, but we must be sure that it's safe and ethical. Right. We, it would be way too easy to continue with a mocking tone towards Brexit Britain, because we do that continuously anyway. But it would be as easy to go the other way around as well, and perhaps too easy, to repeat the set critique that AI is full of biases and as such, surprise, surprise, ideological. Well, yes. But of course, this is where we need to really move on as well. Unpicking the particular theme itself is more complex than the face value of just stating the fact that it's ideological. In addition, we need to be investigating what forms of rationality are being incorporated into infrastructures, often bluntly indeed called AI, more accurately the links between large data sets, their movements, their relation to forms of calculation, analytics, projection, prediction, machine vision, vision machine learning and more. And this is where, besides academic research, of course, such institutions as AI Now in New York or Algorithmic Justice League, etc., have found their own context. Of course, AI means more than just artificial intelligence. Consider alien intelligence, animal intelligence, alternative intelligence, automated intelligence, and the many other A's that form the cultural history and the wider context in which AI can be articulated as a historical phenomenon. AI and its particular root from the cultural imaginaries and real infrastructures of Cold War robotics and cybernetics was already for a long time a question related to military infrastructures, of course, as well as forms of epistemologies of governance in the ways in which governance mobilizes forms of knowing about the world, forms of simulation, prediction, observation, control, Biased futures emerge already as part of these scenario plannings for the preparation of multiple possible futures. One could also claim that our intelligence was always artificial, at something that was bootstrapped as part of our milieus, as part of our environments, which increasingly are, of course, nowadays technological. From Catherine Hales to Mark Hansen to many other theorists that are very familiar to the transmediale crowd, this distributed nature of intelligence or cognition has been one way to start unpacking the operational meaning of what intelligence does. It also becomes a point about the fluidity of whatever was anyway human and whatever was anyway not so human from a cognitive or affective point of view. And it also starts to unfold a picture as to what fantasies, what are the fantasies of the transhuman and how they have become as actually a rather narrow, rather Western, rather privileged, indeed radically, uh, racially pretty white, and in terms of gender, yes, pretty male view of humanity. That's why other roots are very tempting. Hence, to speak of critical post-humanities like Rosie Braidotzi does, refers here to the biopolitical context in which non-human animals, ecological formations, political economy, affective economy, become central ways to understand the various fantasies of future of humanity as political projections. Hence, post-humanities emerge from these decades of work in context of queer studies, feminism, post-colonial studies, animal studies, and more. Or for, for example, there are already the forms of queer formulations of embodiment in digital culture that transgender theorist Rosanna Stone offered already in the 1990s. Indeed, there are many interesting avenues already that we can tap into. And the more interesting trans then emerges as this sort of an embodied take that speaks to the forms of many other intelligences and they form the landscape of identity in technological culture and they were mobilized already by many activist groups and contexts. 
And one could add the work of many theorists and indeed activists and artists at Transmediale that we've heard from the past days. China Meeble's phrased voice in a recent interview seems to capture something of the moment and the current utopias that have overwhelmed across multiple media platforms. In Meeble's words, there has not in living memory been a better time to be a fascist. We live in a utopia, it just isn't ours. To speak of imaginaries and then is not merely to imagine possibilities of liberation itself important, but also to acknowledge to what other ends, fabulations and imaginaries are constantly being harnessed and demonstrated by the varieties of, for instance, our alt-right imaginaries. Or then how on a more mundane level, the sort of racism and bias that is embedded deeper into infrastructure and is becoming more visible due to critical work from AI to search engines to digital vision to facial recognition, again, a lot of themes that we've been discussing in the past days. And then artistic work such as Lawrence Lex presents a further angle of looking at different scales where the infrastructure AI might offer is not merely about what we think about it, but also where it is placed, situated, as well as incorporates a different sort of a logic as to looking back. How are we being seen and targeted from the point of view of that? Not merely a reproduction of existing biases, for sure that's true as well, but also a transformative creation of new sorts of politically significant, also troubling territories questions. And it's in this context that we invited our speakers to address the changes that AI is bringing to thinking, understanding territories, cultures, groups of people, and indeed, to discuss the emerging political counterfictions and imaginaries. We have three speakers. Um, the first speaker is going to be Francis Hunger. I'll introduce him briefly. Um, Francis Hunger combines artistic and media theoretic research with narration through installations, radio plays, and performances. His works realize critical examination of the historiography of technology and the ideologically charged knowledge and power constellations. He's taught at the Academy of Art and Design at Burg Giebigstein. Um, since 2015, he's been doing his PhD that relates to histories of relational database. He's doing that in Weimar at Bauhaus University. He's published on various topics on Soviet ternary computers, on satellite board and footprints, and co-edited The History Has Left the Building, um, together with Inke Arns, and also Search Routines, co-edited with Lin Lena Brüggemann. So let's warmly welcome our first speaker, Francis Hunger. Hello. Um, before I start, I would like to thank Sebastian, Pavel, and Connie for reviewing the skip, script. It was a big help. And now the talk begins. Um, it's called Artificial Death Intelligence. Um, yeah, and we see up there that's uh, the work Autonomous, Autonomous Trap uh, by artist James Bridle, um, where James Bridle used ritual magic on the backdrop of Mount Parnassus in central Greece, the place of the Oracle of Delphi. He created a magic salt circle of road markings that could trap an autonomous car by letting it in, but not letting it out. This example is based on his own approaches to build an autonomous car using artificial intelligence technology. It presents a fantasy, the self-driving autonomous car, and mockingly tells us a lot about a society which sets its priorities towards developing such a thing. Did that happen to you that you thought, wow, speech recognition got really strong, wow, um, they are developing these autonomous cars, and on YouTube I can now watch these uh, videos of walking robots um, walking all by themselves. Well, it happened to me. <coughs> However, I reminded myself that the long trail of automation through using machinery reaches back through the industrial age, and soon I began to look into the machine and the question of labor. 
I agree that today's pattern recognition shows better quality in recognizing patterns in language, image orientation, and similar fields of perception. But is pattern recognition equal to intelligence? Well, you can guess I'm gonna argue no. Pattern recognition is about perception, and it's about a statistical inference with a body of data. These areas have become increasingly better over the past decade, and that's how I want to call it. I want to call it enhanced pattern recognition and not artificial intelligence. Multiple factors play into the overall growth in automation during these past decades. First of all, search engine technology has grown and become better in sifting through large amounts of data distributed over various ge geographic locations. Google introduced tools such as MapReduce or Bigtable in the mid-2000s that allow for the distributed storage of data um, globally. Open source software for data mining and unstructured information such as Hadoop became available to many and in turn, these approaches made today's large-scale data centers, the so-called cloud, um, possible. Secondly, sentiment analysis, that is the analysis of the uh, meaning of a succession of words, has become better based on statistical techniques. For the past 200 years, attention has been the driver for value generation in traditional mass media. Relevant content such as news or entertainment, redire redirected the reader's attention towards advertisements. Mass media does not necessarily produce content, but it lives from debate, critique, and dissent meaning. Mass media demand and foster the effective, and platforms like Google, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat have learned how to capitalize on the effective in a way not known before, using language recognition and sentiment analysis. From this perspective, we can identify fake news and its effectual agency not only as a form of power over discourse, but also as an, well, economically important operation. Third, the area of pattern recognition for visual and auditive content has advanced. When IBM engineer Arthur Samuel researched computer chess playing in 1959, he coined this term machine learning. And learning is used in machine learning in a very narrow sense. Computers can process mathematical objects, they can't understand meaning. To generate something close to meaning in the human sense, statistical inference is used against large amounts of existing categorized information. And categorization is the decision about what gets included and what gets excluded. And data is that what has been recorded and included and not has been discarded. Spe specialists train a specific neural network by feeding it with information such, such as a large quantity of pictures of dogs that actually got labeled dog. In addition, lots of users on Flickr, for example, they have tagged their Creative Commons images seriously, and Yahoo could build from that a very large data set that is uh, now used uh, to test and um, yeah, to test machine training uh, and to develop it further. And I'm interested in this this label that has been put into putting on this, um, these labels onto individual images, with, which then gets amassed to a real big data set. All that labor that has been spent means that also human consciousness has, has been used to do that, actually. Um, during the neural network's constitution, an ecology of algorithms processes the pixels of an image labeled dog. They calculate the pixels' values to identify repetitions and similarities in colors, brightness, position, and such. 
or they try to identify subparts such as eyes, legs, ears, and store these patterns. From these similarities, they form a so-called neural network that is a series of nodes described through number values. Trained sets can be calculated against an incoming data stream and eventually recognize something. Roboticist Rodney Brooks, formerly of MIT, comments, I'm quoting, machine learning, machine learning is very brittle and it requires lots of preparation by human researchers or engineers, special purpose coding, special purpose sets of training data, and a custom learning structure for each new problem domain. Today's machine learning is not at all the sponge-like learning that humans engage in, quote end. With all that labor involved, what would you do if you don't want to spend too much money on wages? Well, for instance, you fight off the formation of worker unions as uh, just 15 fired workers of the tech startup Lanetics experienced a few days ago. That's one example. Or the other one, um, you, appropriate, you appropriate unpaid labor for data training through something like captures. Originally, captures helped us to prevent spam. Today, they also produce volume. Artists Silvio Loroso and Sebastian Schmieg have recorded all the captures that they solved over the past five years. That's uh, quite an impressive work, actually. Um, and they demonstrate how users classify data for Google Street View and other services. To realize that automation goes hand in hand with human labor is one way for me to approach and deconstruct the myths of artificial intelligence, and I'm looking forward to see more projects in this um, area addressing this. In machine learning, bias is not coincidental, it is systemic. Computers need ranking to generate some sort of meaning. But the less biased, for instance, a decision tree is, the more calculation you have to do to compare all its branches. That's called the bias variance trade-off, and so it's, more, it's actually more economically to have bias uh, in your data. Another technique is data cleaning, and data cleaning resembles the cuttings of unwanted leaves by a French Renaissance gardener. But where the gardener had aesthetic reasons to tame nature, today the taming of data is also of economical origin. A given neural network is restricted to information that can actually be calculated, information that exists as a stream of distinct numbers, and information that is not noisy. And it, uh, it uh, uh, needs information that it actually knows about that the information is there, so it needs an information model. That what has been split off in the process of formalizing information is not existent. And this can lead to the exclusion of any information that potentially could level out bias. It's not only the algorithms, the queries, or the model that introduce bias, often enough, it's the underlying data itself. Microsoft engineers, they have learned this once again, the hard way, with their public Twitter chatbot, uh, Twitter chatbot Tay, supposedly an artificial intelligence. It was equipped with a semi-supervised neural network that should further go, grow through user input. And well, input the users did. A group of trolls, techies, and teenage geeks um, fed Tay with racist and anti-Semitic information and turned it into an extremist right-wing propaganda blurter. What they understood is the trained neural network calculates the, the meaning, or let's better say the statistical correlation of incoming information against the existing data body. They managed to manipulate that data body. Microsoft's engineers switched off Tay after less than 24 hours. They tried to better it, they tried to repair it. Are Microsoft engineers programmers, or are they educators, or are they psychotherapists? 
When the industry today uses the term machine learning, they're really, willingly deceiving us because, well, I would argue there is no learning in machines, and I'm looking forward to actually discuss it together. Um, another discussion looms behind these developments. The questioning of the premise that led to comparing the human brain with neural networks. Proponents of this idea cannot think other of the human brain than that it is an apparatus that computes. They cannot think of the world other than that it is computable. Only by this premise of computer, computer morphization, they have the reason to believe they were able to produce a machine that could replace the human brain. But the human brain includes many modes of thinking like deduction, induction, symbolic reasoning, emotional intelligence, spatial logic, short-term memory, and long-term memory. In addition, computeromorphization by engineers misses out on that part of the body that is dirty, that is emotional and dysfunctional. It is missing out on the effect on thinking conditioned by something like, for instance, low blood pressure, by depression or by desire. In short, it, it is missing out on those psychic and psychologic, uh, uh, physiologic effects that make each body individual. To a large extent, that position is missing out on how our surroundings also affect thinking. I'm sitting in a busy cafe, I'm walking a street, I'm climbing a mountain, or my children are spreading noise, or I'm sitting in a large, dark space with a distant voice mumbling. Artist Lauren McCarthy replaced the algorithms of Alexa and similar home innovation technology with herself. She monitored and manipulated a living space, opening doors, switching on light, playing music, and answering questions to the people remotely connected with her. So she was at a very other place um, than the performance took place. Um, it's an example of reverse algorithmization in an artistic performance by, hu by human. Reintroducing, that's how I kind of interpret it, error, dirt, misunderstanding, and being able to interact beyond a given information model. It shows very well how beyond the pure speed of calculation, machinery falls short of human-like intelligence when it produces output that is statistically close to human perception. I was waiting for this, actually, yeah. Um, basically, this was uh, uh, the reason why I wrote this whole text. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, Portland-based copywriter Karen Sack, so the credits go to her, Karen Sack, and at, on Twitter she is at Teen Biscuit, um, created a series of memes in late 2015. So this is one, just one of six or seven or eight or ten beautiful of these compositions. Um, so she was using Google image search and rearranged the pictures of cats and biscuits or chihuahuas and muffins using her phone's album function. Um, professor for neuroscience and psychology at Skidmore College, Flip Phillips, ran this meme through the image recognition algorithm of the online calculation machine Wolfram Alpha and demonstrated a 50% hit rate. This is where we are at with pattern recognition using day-to-day -to -day tools, uh, something that is, let's say, less powerful than Google TensorFlow, for instance, uh, such as Wolfram Alpha. So why all this hype? I consider it a historical player, an attempt to find a void somewhere where the investment of capital still returns profit. Today's engineers and managers know the winner takes it all. They aim to be the first in the exploitation and extraction of data from subjectivity. If data is a raw material and information is a product, then it needs human labor and machine labor to transform one into another. 
like the steam engine to the spinning jenny computational capital that is computing machinery to extract data and the ability to employ it by using algorithms adds productivity. In contrast, it is human labor that in capitalism adds value. We witness the extension of labor into areas that formerly have been leisure time, so for instance, user creativity spent on and accumulated by platforms like Facebook, Twitter, etc. And this is the first mode of data production. The second mode of data production, of data productivism, is uh, realized through the recording of transactional data, produced when every human action and interaction gets recorded. Human subjectivity is the soil and data is the cotton of the 21st century. Computational capital is the machinery to harvest and to colonize it. The surplus productivity and value from automatization could be dispersed equally, but sadly, well, it stays with the capital owners. If we understand how the extensive extraction of raw material has created the ecological crisis of the last century, which is re re reaching into this century, we get a glimpse into the future. And we get a glimpse into a future of a subjectological crisis where human subjectivity has been exhausted as raw material of value production. So, I guess all, all kinds of nervous breakdowns um, of those involved. Um, we need an understanding how enhanced pattern recognition does not lead to a super intelligence, but has the potential to replace certain areas of human activity and labor. How do we develop our own critical language to talk about enhanced pattern recognition? How can we form critical movements to save subjectivity from calculation? Are there ways out of value production? Entangled and coerced into the ideology of solutionism, how do we address, criticize, undermine, infiltrate, and turn around the male-dominated engineering cultures, the felons who are building all this? Is there a narration that emphasizes the instability of enhanced pattern recognition and that shatters the notion of predictability? All in all, how can we trouble the calculable? Uh, the calculable? That's it. Thank you very much. We'll have questions at the end so we can have a discussion and uh, invite you as well as part of it. Um, I don't know about you, but every time I see that image, I'm also not it's only machines that are confused. I'm confused whether I should go or when I see the dog or whether I should go mmm when I see the muffin. Um, it gives me special pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Ana Tessera Pinto who is familiar to many of you in Berlin, but also many of you outside Berlin through her writings, her work. She's a lecturer at the UDK here in Berlin and a research fellow at the Leuphana University in Lüneburg. Her writings are indeed familiar to many of you. They have appeared in many of the journals we read, EFLUX, Springerin, Camera Austria, Art Agenda, Mus, Fries, Domus, and the list goes on. She is the editor of The Reluctant Narrator that came out with Sternberg and has also contributed to various books, including Alice of Your Mind. There was a book on augmented intelligence and its traumas, also Nervosa Systeme that came out in 2016, and also Animals that came out, out in, uh, in 60, uh, 2016 out from MIT Press. Um, on top of that, she has a lovely, amazing title, Capitalism with a Transhuman Face, and it's all yours, Anna. Thank you. Is this working? It's working. Well, now that we all know that the internet is all made of muffins and chihuahuas, I think that, you know, <laughs> we already acquired all the knowledge we need. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks uh, uh, for the lovely introduction. Thanks for inviting me. So I 
want to start, uh, I don't really have a proper paper or a theory, just a couple of notes put together. And I wanted to start by bringing back the 1951 paper that Ellen Turing, uh, Turing wrote, describing the thought experiment, which became widely known as the Turing test, though Turing himself termed it the imitation game. And the imitation game uh, was a game meant to tackle the question of artificial intelligence at the time known as machine intelligence. But the first experiment doesn't involve machines at all. The first experiment involves two players, one man and a woman, who are hidden from view but able to communicate via the computer terminal. The judge job, in this case, is to determine which player is the man and which is the woman. And if he gets it wrong, oftentimes, uh, one has to ask what does it mean about manhood. The second experiment, the experiment that became widely known, involves a, uh, is a variation that involves a man and a machine. And now the judge's job is to decide which of the contestants is human. And if he gets it wrong, oftentimes, the computer must be a passable simulation of a human being, and hence intelligent. The imitation game is usually misunderstood as a proof that the converse is also true. If a computer passes the test, it must be a passable simulation of intelligence and ends human. Now, unfortunately, and though I think that the Turing test lends itself to a queer reading, what happened was that it became, or it opened a door for the nervous system to be described as a Turing machine. And once this analogy was established, neurons could be, and here I'm quoting Orit Alpern, sort of as signs and neural nets sort of as semiotic situations. In other words, an identity was forged between the neural activity of activating or inhibiting a signal, yes or no, the logical values of true and false, and the two only possible states for an electronic circuit, on or off. But this prominent list of digital binaries is constantly dogged by an embarrassing supplement that stealthily undermines its alignment of technology, technology and transcendency, male and female. And this brings to mind, or at least to my mind, an analogy with Marquis de Sade anti-republican manifesto, Francais encore un effort si vous voulez être républicain. Whereas de Sade made clear that any attempt to give the right of enjoyment the form of universal norm is doomed to failure because by definition sexual fantasy excludes reciprocity, any attempt to give the binary male-female the form of code is doomed to failure or is doomed to follow bigotry because, by definition, the substitution of gender subverts the post-body dimension of informational ontologies. Which brings me to my first point. What are we talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence? Is artificial intelligence truly intelligence? Well, obviously the question needs unpacking. Strictly speaking, when we ask whether artificial intelligence is intelligence, what we mean to ask is whether artificial intelligence has a psychology. A rather more technical, or in other words, less melodramatic question could be phrased as, is computation enough to define intelligence? And that question, of course, depends on what you mean by intelligence. So we leave that for the discussion, so I'm just going to jump over this part. <laughs> in short, the coming cyborg-like entity is, or it will substantiate or materialize as the smart city and not as a Terminator-like figure. There is a sharp divide, if not an outright contrast, between the infrastructural or logistic dimension of artificial intelligence, on the one hand, its economic potential, or what you call the artificial intelligence market, and last but not least, the way artificial intelligence is personified and fictionalized. And yet, these dimensions feed off and bleed onto each other, inflating what Matteo Pasquinelli yesterday called the artificial intelligence bubble. The perplexing nature of same, some speculation emerging from transhumanist, effective altruist, Bay Area techno-libertarian and artificial intelligence existential risk groups, this is a true name, by the way, made me toy with the idea of surveying these blogs or online forums in a similar vein to what Klaus Teveleit did with the diaries of the Fry Corps in his seminal work, Male Fantasies. For those not familiar with Teveleit, in Male Fantasies, Teveleit examined the diaries written by members of the Fry Corps, who were the German paramilitary units which refused to disarm after the end of World War I, and was stricken by their grotesque personifications of communism. 
a similar survey of the ways in which I, artificial intelligence is personified is, in my view, long overdue. Be it with communism or artificial intelligence, these personifications, however grotesque, are not necessarily wrong nor false. In fact, they carry an element of truth. War, however life-destroying, was for the Freikorps a livelihood or a means of life. Communism posed a very concrete threat to, the Prus to Prussian military militarism or to Prussian military order, and by extension to the lower ranks of aristocracy that Freikorps recruits typically belong to. But they also carry an element of drama. The word communism, Tevolite argues in these diaries, is never used to refer to a form of political economy entailing the collectivization of resources. Rather, communism appears to be synonymous with castration, with the fear of being emasculated and rendered powerless, politically as well as sexually. There are several parallels we may draw here, and the male personifications of artificial intelligence always fit squarely in the antagonic matrix. Sorry, do we have, could, we, could you move this for me? The, my, uh, the male personifications of artificial intelligence always fit squarely into the antagonist matrix. Once self-aware, artificial intelligence will usurp control from humans and the latter are forced into submission or face extinction. Female gendered artificial intelligence has a completely different character. A character which I would argue has a lot more to do with the relationship between the male gaze and the female body and this fantasy of total penetration than it has with artificial intelligence. And I just wanted to show these images because I think there's an interesting continuity that can be drawn here with these much older uh, anatomical models like the anatomical Venus and, of course, the way the female body is depicted in, as a cyborg or as a cyborg-like fantasy. Here, the yearning for an unresisting and unrejecting object fills romantic and our sexual fantasies, and from Cherry 2000, that's the first image in the series uh, film, very early film, uh, Cherry 2000, to the very famous Her, female gendered artificial intelligence are typically images of female subordination under the guise of idealized womanhood. Within this representational system, to paraphrase Paul B. Preciado, masculinity is defined necropolitically by men's rights to inflict death, while femininity is defined biopolitically by women's obligation to serve men. In analog times, this obligation was first and foremost the obligation to bear children. But as evolutionary biology began to treat genetic information as an essential code, the very code of life, a semiotic slippage began to entangle computational code and biological semen as the bearer of the male issue, whether this issue is a child or a virtual avatar. A recent addition to the artificial intelligence bestiary perfectly illustrates what, would, what could be construed as the encroachment of necropolitics into the domain of biopower. And here I mean a thought experiment that emerged on July 21st of 2010 on the Less Wrong Forum, a Bay Area forum run by Eliezer Yurokovsky, the co-founder of Machine Intelligence Research Institute, called Rocco's Basilist, or which became later known as Rocco's Basilist. In his post, a user named Rocco hypothesizes that a coming artificial intelligence might wish to retroactively punish the humans who did not knowingly contribute to its initial development. Rocco's hypothetical artificial intelligence is omniscient, he knows categorically whether or not you have read Rocco's post, and he is omnipotent. It is categorically able to resurrect your mind via digital assimilation and then proceed to torture, to torture you to eternity. Though Rocco's thought experiment sounds unhinged, his fears are allegedly sustained by Bayesian probability, a premise which instilled such horror in the minds of those who congregated at the forum that Yudovkovsky erased the threat, admonishing Rothko to quit chartering. The erasure of the initial threat did little to stop the story from spreading, however, and Rocco's artificial intelligence became a prominent avatar for neo-reactionary transhumanism, popularly known as Rocco's Basilisk, or simply the Basilisk. Now, commotion notwithstanding, 
It is hard to see how exactly Bayes' theorem, theorem might apply to Rocco's vengeful IE. There is no prior manifestation or historical record of any kind of artificial intelligence, malevolent or otherwise, and in the absence of reliable data, any assumption about this artificial intelligence psychology would be fairly arbitrary. Those who, and I include myself here since I try to reproduce Rocco's calculations, seek mathematical proof of the prediction's likelihood are missing the point. The content of Rocco's thought experiment is aesthetic, not scientific. It speaks through symbol and allegory. Hence the personification of artificial intelligence as an audible beast and of code as the male issue. Now, as I said, the fictionalization of artificial intelligence as an element of drama, but it also has an element of truth. In recent years, artificial intelligence took over Wall Street in all in-flight magazines as the new capitalist frontier. The global artificial intelligence market is expected to expand at a compound annual growth rate of 50% during the pre period from 2017 to 2021. Artificial intelligence is at the moment the only fast-growing sector in the economy and the sole compelling attempt to project another phase of capitalist accumulation beyond the already exhausted neoliberal phase. So from a market perspective, artificial intelligence is a reformist project it promises to restore declining profit margins. The gendering of deep learning does to artificial intelligence what porn does to sex. It renders it lurid. And in spite of the feminist appropriation of the cyborg-like body as a degendering machine, bionics continues to follow bigotry. Humanoid robots are gendered according to traditional roles, military technologies male, service technologies female, and emotional labor a market worth one trillion, that is 60% of the official economy, is still heavily feminized. That is, 57% of the jobs set out to be displaced by technology between now and 2026, which are typically done by, by women. And to make matters worse, men's dominance in, in uh, the uh, IT industries and biotechs is reversing the prior trend towards par equality or labor parity. Though all forms of social organization are predicated on the privatization of property, to quote Mackenzie work, sorry. <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. Though all forms of social organization predicated on the privatization of property give rise to a class relation, Private property is not synonymous with capitalism, and the class relations that emerge out of the digital turn are not necessarily relations between capital owners and wage labor. The digital economy changes the processes through which technology is accumulated as capital, and the resulting class relation is at odds with the reproduction of social life. The crucial question regarding machine learning is the question of ownership. Who owns artificial intelligence? To let the private sector, as we now do, Amazon, Google, which just bought DeepMind, Facebook, IBM, and Microsoft, lead the authority of the inscrutable, leads to a dramatic restoration of corporate profit and elite power. And whatever we choose to call it, digital feudalism, kleptofascism, post-democracy, having these private companies as the sole providers of essential public services, think, for instance, in healthcare or urban management, implies a fundamental division between the winners and losers of the digital turn. That is, between the tech-savvy gentry, who devote their lives to the basilisk, and a vast underclass of underemployed or precariously employed, who are further degraded by the basilisk. Now, not all social tensions find political expression. They do, however, take up a form. They tend to align themselves with, or attach themselves to, objects, idioms, or tropes. An ideology is the name we give to these narratives that do not queer rationally, but rather queer, but queer aesthetically or emotionally, as Lauren Berlin put it. Like all commodities, artificial intelligence speaks the idiom of the fetish. It decontextualizes events into pure, terminator-like form. Saturated with paranoid urgency, nihilism, and phobophobia, the basilisk is yet another socially sanctioned narrative in which male aggression accrues cultural capital and, by extension, economic value. Politically speaking, 
Uh, shall I stop here? Maybe better here? Yeah? One minute? Politically speaking, a lot is at stake in the conflict between posthumanism and transhumanism. Though the terms posthuman and transhuman are used pretty much interchangeably, they tend to represent radically different political projects. Transhumanism developed out of the anarcho capitalist extropian philosophy professed by Max Moore and retained its libertarian frame. The transhuman project is predicated on the markers of the liberal self, autonomy, individualism, and self-possession, hence its obsession with self-enhancement and individual immortality. And uh, needless to say, immortality too is a male fantasy or it or also has a gender dimension because statistically men always wish to live one, longer whilst women wish to look younger. And even the uh, infamous Countess Erzbeth Bathory that was, uh, uh, or who was accused of like baiting in the blood of virgins that she murdered was not trying to, be, to become immortal, she was trying to preserve her looks. Uh, by contrast, the posthuman is an attempt to exit the trappings of the humanist subject and what Daniel Dennett called its monotheist norms, a unitary economy of the soul, propriety and identity of the agent as self. Hence the focus on systems, interaction and the structure of communication channels rather than on single entities. In other words, posthumanism is the attempt to find a vocabulary which would enable us to exit chauvinist epistemologies. Asserting the right to individual enhancement, needless to say, would magnify already existing classes, social privileges, as well as deepen social divides. Popular strains of subaltarian transhumanism also have a fascist sheen, anticipating, and here I'm quoting Suya Hayer, a powerful leader making use of intelligence enhancement to put himself in an unassailable position. This is a vision of artificial intelligence, qua Viagra for the 1%. But though a transhuman hyper-race might seem far, from a, far unlikely, as Suya Hayer goes on noting, existing technology is already immersing us in the radical disruption proffered by cyber-libertarian doctrine. Just think how the gig economy skirts the social contract. There is also a hidden racial dimension to the codification of technology as a forward unidirectional mo motion and the alignment of technology and futurity tends to totalize the global as a frictionless space, ultimately located in free zones and smart cities, rather than in a simultaneity of different temporalities, a view which basically devalues the experience of non-whites as underdeveloped and backward. Hence, I think this is my final question, how to be a futurist without being a fascist? That is, that is such a great one-liner. That was good. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, sh I should have just like that did one sentence and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, our third speaker, Yukui, is most likely also very familiar to a lot of you here and a lot of people outside Berlin as well. Um, Yuk works on philosophy of technology. Um, he's currently a researcher and lecturer at Leuphana University in Lüneburg. As, as well, as well as visiting professor at the China Academy of Art. Um, he's author of the existence on, on the existence of digital objects um, that came out with the University of Minnesota Press, but also um, the question concerning technology in China, an essay in Cosmotechnics that came out quite recently from Urbanomic, and also co-editor of the anthology 30 years after Les Amadrio, Art, Science and Theory, that came out in 2015, it's all yours, Jok. Um, okay, um, thank you very much for support for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, every time when I, when I talk uh, with others about artificial intelligence, I always have a very ambi ambivalent feeling. Um, it is because it was my first training. I was uh, I first uh, studied. Uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence before I moved to study philosophy, that is to say, to become a proletariat. Um, um, but I, 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 um, I'm not sure that it is a good question to ask for an unbiased or without biased future, uh, because if we criticize that algorithms has a bias, and if we look for an 
uh, an algorithm without bias, it is actually an affirmation of the algorithmic governmentality, and that is a, a self-critique. Now, what I think that what is what could be opposed to a bias is not uh, unbiased, is not without bias, but rather the question of diversity. So, what opposed to, to to bias is not unbiased, but rather diversity, because every algorithm has uh, epistemological and ontological presupposition, and it, well, you can say that it is already a bias. But what I'm trying to say uh, in this um, brief talk uh, is uh, well, actually a provocation is to uh, not to directly address the question of um, artificial intelligence but to think of the is it possible to think about the diversity of future or even i could say the bifurcation of future now let me let me quote a sentence from uh, Karl Schmitt. the concept of humanity is an an um, especially useful ideological instrument of imperialist expansion. And in its ethical humanitarian form, it is a specific vehicle of economic imperialism. Here one is reminded of somewhat modified expression of Proudhon's. Whoever invokes humanity wants to cheat. Now, the deception hidden in the world, in the world humanity, as articulated by Kashmir above, has haunted us since the 15th century when the world was used, firstly used to describe a human race, humans collectively. Now, the word um, humanity is, illusion, is illusory, not only in that it is highly ideological, Schmidt uh, uh, asserted with it can be instrumentalized to denounce the enemy as inhuman and to claim the self as the only human, as what we have seen uh, recently, uh, but also because humanity as such does not exist. Uh, whoever speaks in his name is lying. Now, if we recall Schmidt's um, statements today, it is because different ex-humanism or humanity should this X be post-trans or super, a scrambling to present as a definite future of humanity. And if we follow Schmidt by suspending the term humanity, we will need to consider the cons consequences of the collapse of its, of its semantic reference and further reflect on the crisis of the humanities plural in view of the terms um, of the terms increasing backwardness in relation to technological acceleration. To refuse the term humanity is to refuse the future of humanity, precisely because built as it is upon an illusion, such a future is even more deceptive than humanity itself. Then the immediate question is the following. Having refused the future of humanity, how should we perceive the question of the future? What kind of future can we still have other than returning to the non-modern by pretending that modernization, globalization, colonization never happened? This is the point of departure of, uh, of, of this talk, which attempts to understand what is at stake in the question of futurity described by the technological hype of transhumanism and technological singularity, human-machine hybrid, uh, augmentable intelligence, perfect emotional control, memory transplantation, immortality, artificial intelligence, smart city, space immigration, uh, as you can name. Now the Japanese uh, animation classic Ghost in the Shell has best shown us the scenarios of such an imminent, an, an imminent future to plug in or not to plug in, that is the question. Future which is uh, the yet to be or the yet to come, is already closed in a technological determinism or bad materialism, whether new or old. Although not yet there, this not yet is already known, and what is unknown it is no longer in question, because the unknown is that which is excluded. Either it is the feeling of impending catastrophe, or it is the mysterious that is not yet proved 
and endorsed by techno science, and remains the task of poet. The future of humanity, uh, I propose, is the product of a synchronization based on the global temporal assets realized by modern technology. By synchronization, I mean, first of all, the sharing of a common temporal standard, such as cross time, that unifies all production processes and situation of capital, as Carl Schmitt calls economic imperialism. Second, the common view of the world history in the process of making according to the following time assets, pre-modern, modern, postmodern post apocalypse. If the singularity signifies the end of history in the Hegelian sense, the emergence of homo deus, as you know, coincidentally corresponds to the theo to, to, to the to theodicy as the end of history. You know that Hegel took this idea from Leibniz. We would say that the future of humanity is a synchronized effect produced by technological development that points towards a, a phantasmal homo deus. Uh, while reflections on other futures are discredited as being variants of epistemological humanism, uh, that is a term attributed to me by uh, the British philosopher Nick Land. He said, I'm an epistemological humanist. Now, the synchronization that, com that uh, commenced with colonization and modernization gave rise to the globalization um, of today, a globalization that is, however, already at an end. Because if a synchronization of production and capital flow attains optimization by eliminating technological differences, then dialectically, once the so-called global south takes the lead in technological completion, the advantage and privilege enjoyed by the global north for the um, for the past century will be jeopardized. And consequently, protectionist, neo-reactionaries, and the extreme right will surge in popularity, reflecting an unhappy consciousness, consciousness in the sense of Hegel in view of the decline of the West again. However, if we follow this logic regarding the competition between countries over the development of artificial intelligence, then it will be as Vladimir Putin told the Russian children uh, on the 1st of September, whoever lives in AI will rule the world. Because no matter how the catastrophe, uh, how the catastrophe is divided, we are still on the same global temporal axis and therefore moving toward the same talos. With rejecting this concept of humanity and its claims to the future allow us to conceive a new concept of world history that is able to bifurcate into diversities. Question mark. The bifurcation of futures can only be achieved, uh, and I can only make a, a strong um, statement here without being able really to elaborate, by breaking away from the synchronization described above to envisage different technological futures, which I call the technodiversity, this speculation is based on an antinomy of the universality of technology addressed in my, in my recent book, where I think you can find it um, um, outside as well. And this antinomy would be stated as the following thesis, technology is an anthropological universal uh, understood as the exteriorization of memory and the liberation of bodily organs, as some anthropologists and philosophers of technology have formulated. Antithesis. Technology is not anthropologically um, universal. It is enabled and constrained by particular cosmologies, which go beyond functionalities and utilities. Now, the particularity of the Kantian antinomy is that each thesis holds on its own, but opposes the other. Such an antinomy must be resolved by a form of thinking beyond universality and particularity. Synchronization relies on the thesis and undermines the antithesis. To answer the question concerning futurity, we must clarify the antithesis before a resolution can emerge. This is why I propose that each culture should develop its own history of cosmotechnics by systematically 
discovering and formulating its epistemologies and tracing the history of its epistem epistems in response to the current historical moment of synchronization. Now here is a, a, a very quick uh, definition of what I mean by cosmotechnics, the unification of the cosmic and moral orders through technical activities. Every culture has its own cosmotechnics, each differing from the other in terms of relation and dynamics of these relations. Now the aim of conceptualizing cosmotechnics is to reopen the question of technics that was unfortunately closed down in the past century. I will only give you a brief example here. Uh, following the analysis of Martin Heidegger's 1949 lecture, The Question Concerning Technology, we find two concepts of essences of technics. The first is the Greek sense of technique, which means poiesis or bringing forth. Um, and the second is modern technology, the essence of which is no longer the Greek technique, but rather enframing or gestel, meaning that everything is considered calculable and exploitable as resources, uh, what you call bishdant. But it is difficult, and this, I, because this thesis from Heidegger has been accepted um, uh, everywhere almost, but the problem, the difficulty is, and is that it is difficult, if not impossible, to position other kinds of technique, for example, the Chinese, Indian, or Amazonian, without reducing them to Greek technique, which is self and it is self evident that they are not modern technologies. Now, I would like to conclude by uh, raising a question, um, which is also a challenge. How can these discoveries and histories of cosmotechnic contribute to the bifurcation of futures? Now, it is, of course, impossible uh, to answer this question in this uh, 15 minutes. But what I want to emphasize here is the urgency of reopening the question of technology and therefore putting a homogeneous technological future into question as well. Every culture will have to investigate its histories of cosmotechnics, which in the past century have been um, reduced to one history of technology measured by the advancement of particular techniques or technical systems, from metallurgy to paper making or railways. To prepare for these invest investigations to emerge, we must reject the notion of the future of humanity presented as the realization of the homo deus or the progress of modernity. This is no rooted refusal of computational machines and modern technologies, but rather a matter of reappropriating. At least I cannot talk about this, but you can look at it. I cannot talk about this, but you can look at it. Uh, uh, this is a uh, no, um, well, um, but rather a matter of reappropriating these technologies through the rediscovery of cosmotechnics so as to overcome the limit they imposed on us. Uh, like the uh, artificial intelligence, by rejecting the linear path attached to the image of technological progress, we also reject the politics of acceleration as the only option available for resolving social and political problems. Because if the bifurcation of futures is possible, acceleration can no longer be measured by quantity, for example, the degree of automation or amount of productivity. Instead, it will be measured by the capacity of technology to bifurcate into heterogeneous cosmotechnics, which in turn allows multiple futures to emerge and remain irreducible to the, to the global essence of time perceived as world history since European modernity. I finish here. Thank you for your attention. Excellent, thank you very much, um, Yuk and all of all the three of you. Um, we are slightly running late, but we have a good 15 minutes or actually a bit more for um, questions. And I would like now already to open it to the audience because we are running a bit late and I want to make sure that you also have a chance to ask our fabulous trio of speakers questions about AIs, questions about Features, questions about bias, questions that relate to these various angles that all spoke to infrastructures but also imaginaries. You see the mics, you know what to do. 
Otherwise, I, I will continue. Um, one thing, you know, if you kind of are still forming your questions, one thing that I was thinking as well, and one, one, one sort of a like direction that actually sort of implicitly or, or sometimes a bit more explicitly, especially in Anna's one, um, 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 came up is, is, and we were thinking about this when we were forming the panel, are the kind of various forms of futurisms that have emerged in contemporary practices. And we had a, actually a quick chat with Anna already before the panel as well. Um, such as Lawrence Leck's work on sign of futurism would be a good example. Where do you, I mean, this is, my, this is especially to Anna, but it might resonate with some of these as well. I'm thinking you here as well. Where do you see these kind of practices of imaginary futurisms in contemporary art, adaptation to those particular vocabulary? Because you ended up with that wonderful one-liner, so you must say something about that non-fascist future futurism. Do you want to? Continue a bit. I, I really meant it without malice. <laughs> Uh, I don't know the answer. I think that, uh, uh, you know, of course there's always this question about the moment you align uh, temporality with technology, that you create this kind of totalizing dimension that is predicated on, you know, like whatever technology is pooling, uh, you know, like, or, uh, how do you say, making the f future become uh, present or actualizing the future. And uh, I think that it's, it's very difficult um, uh, to think, I mean, you know, like, of course, as we were talking uh, earlier, uh, it's easy to see how you can uh, uh, open up this dimension when it comes to Sino-Futurism or Afrofuturism, because there is like a, neg uh, a negation involved in these forms of futurism, and the negation is the negation of the present in the sense of like the present that was imposed by colonization or the present that was imposed by Western supremacy. But uh, in terms of uh, when you exit uh, these uh, forms of futurisms, like Afrofuturism, Sinofuturism, I don't know, like whatever uh, other futurisms that one might bring into the discussion, I see we have a question from the audience. <laughs> wow, that was, uh, yeah, no, please. <laughs> no, that was going great, please. Um, yes, thank you very much for three hugely inspiring talks. And I don't have a question. I would like to encourage the three speakers to talk about their disagreements. Because the sense that I had when each of you was talking, that the others were taking notes and thinking, I don't agree with this and I don't agree with that. So I think it would be really interesting if you went through another round of short statements about which are the things that you really disagree about with the others. <laughs> that talk about putting people on the spot. Um, yeah, would you be able to address that a bit in terms of like position as well? Because that might tease out a bit more in terms of these things as well. Um, do you want to, Francis, do you want to somehow dig in? I, you know, somebody needs to go first. I'm, yeah, I'm very sorry, Andreas. I just took notes trying to understand what you were saying. <laughs> I did as well. <laughs> that was so, um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, painful. <laughs> um, well, were you talking about the question of futurisms as well already? That does resonate with bifurcation themes as well. But do you want to pick up on the point as well in terms of teasing out some of the kind of ways in which these talks speak to each other, but also don't speak to each other. Is, is that, is a, it, it is a difficult task. So I, will, I can try, but I would like to respond to the question that they raised at the very beginning regarding uh, fascism and uh, futurism. And why, when, when, when we talk about futurism, it is so closely related to racism, uh, which shouldn't be the case, uh, you know. Uh, um, of course, is uh, because the question of technological development, as I tried to, uh, to, to, to hint in, in this short um, statement, is that the technological development, especially regarding AI robotics and machine learning, is becoming the, um, um, the, the, um, the battlefield of geopolitics. Now, so you, well, that's a, the, uh, if, for example, if you look at what uh, the Russians are trying to do, like uh, when, when, when Putin says that uh, whoever lives in AI will uh, lead the world with um, 
And then there was a response actually to, what, to, to a white paper released in China in a, a month uh, before when the Chinese government says that um, um, in 2030, China will be a leading country in AI. And so you see that there is such a close relation to, to, um, to kind of nationalism, fascism and uh, futurism. But so that's why I think that the only way to go beyond uh, this relation is to think the question of um, techno diversity. Now, um, but regarding that uh, agreement and disagreement, I know that is a, a tricky thing from Andreas. Uh, but I would like to say because um, only one point is that. Whenever I went to uh, a discussion with artists and uh, critical theorists, there is also always uh, where well, there, there were kind of two failures that I identify. One failure is that we will see the equivalence between uh, machines and intelligence, machine intelligence and intelligence. The second, well, we know that this is um, not the case, as you have shown. Now, the second case is. Um, is just to say that well, no, this the machine intelligence can never become human intelligence. But I, I think that if we say this, we are still within the um, within a search for uh, equivalence between uh, human and machine, and this is a, a fundamental failure. And this is also the very bad um, uh, um, uh, beginning to to raise questions. No, because I believe that uh, what is m important now is to have an uh, examination of the relation between human and machines, and this is unfor unfortunately a, a dialectic in the best sense of the world. Uh, of the world. Um, so it's not to pose opposition or to not to make um, put machine and human in the completion, as many of you know, that people even raise the question, will machine replace artists? Because with machine learnings, that they can produce images that are so wonderful that uh, uh, people will uh, vote for them, uh, uh, then the work of artists. Mm -hmm. So this question of equivalence that I find, or kind of critique of equi equivalence, I think that it was rather limited, and we have to move uh, beyond that. Do you want to briefly ask something? Because we have a next question as well. But if you want to briefly, I mean, either one of you, but otherwise we can go to the next let's, question. Let's. OK, sure. Please. Hi, thank you for the talks. Um, I have a question that might tie some things together. Um, at the recent Chaos Congress, uh, science fiction writer Charles Strauss said that we've been living under an AI for about 200 years or so since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the invention of corporations. So I would like to ask if you think it's possible to look at AI as an invention of the corporations to continue the inhumanity of their agenda. That's a great question. Um, who wants to go first um, with brief responses? Well, basically what I was trying to do in my, in my um, talk was to around this notion of the machinic and to always stress how much human labor is involved and how much humans are kind of making the decisions. And I was ending with the argument that uh, we should look into addressing the humans who are kind of creating and working on these systems. So um, I would, this, this kind of uh, idea that was brought forward, uh, it seems to put us into a very powerless uh, position, like saying, oh yeah, I, I, AI has ruled us already for the last 200 years and it will continue for the next 200. That's, well, at least for me, it's not a very uh, interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, um, I think that, of course, you know, like there's, you can open this like metaphorical dimension, but on the other hand, uh, the way you decide to assign these temporalities creates a problem of scale, and the more this temporality, you know, like the greater these temporalities become, the less you feel that there is something or some room for any kind of agency, right? So, like, if you say, like, we've been ruling, we've been ruled by an artificial intelligence already, so, you know, like, of course, the, the, you know, like this, uh, this idea that capitalism is itself uh, substantiation of an artificial intelligence that is like. Um, 
ruling over human life, it's already like a little bit of a trope. Uh, I think we should. So we have the next question. Yeah. yeah. I have a question about the plurality of futures. Um, so when, when you say, for example, bifurcating futures or different, different sort of regimes of knowledge production, but also looking at the idea of um, um, sort of uh, an uneven distribution, re referring back to this uh, fascist pockets now, versus this idea that sort of a total globalizing mechanisms that we're in now actually atomize us and divide us on a very local level. So I was wondering how, how we navigate these uh, things if we look at uh, future, is the future a resource? Are we talking about m multiple futures? I don't really understand how to navigate that. Well, uh, you know, if you are a materialist, you would say that the future, I mean, there is nothing about the future that isn't there already in the present, you know, like, of course, uh, you know, like, if you want a different future, you have to negate the present. You know, like, uh, the choice is clear bef between these two motions. You can have, like, an affirmative motion, and then the future is going to be just a proactive present, or you can negate the present and then probably or hopefully open the possibility for something different to emerge in the future. But, you know, clearly the future is already predicated in the now, you know, like, there's n no such thing as this kind of, like, uh, immaterial or uh, ethereal dimension that you can conjure into existence. Uh, that's why I'm a bit skeptical about this techno-futurist uh, uh, fantasies. Uh, yeah, do you want to briefly you add something as well? We still have a question after that, but you, if you want to. Well, yeah, I think that it is um, around the question how we articulate history. And um, it's also a response to the previous question, because um, um, the, how we look at the question of history, a special history of technology today, of course, you can analyze the, um, the history of artificial intelligence uh, through, uh, uh, from the line of industrial revolution and so on to enterprise, but um, there is also a history which concerns epistemology, for example. Um, um, so I, I think the importance is not to reduce the analysis into only one history, but also to analyze according to different histories. And the question the, concerning the diversity of future, uh, you know, sign of futurism for me is completely problematic. It is not a futurism, it's just a provocative statement about uh, the, the, the kind of uncontrollable development and which everyone is looking forward to or are competing uh, for. I have to stop her. No, 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 no. oh, okay. <laughs> we will try to get at least one question in, but if you yeah, yeah. To, yeah. So when I, when I say diversity, what I try to say is that if we want to really to look into that, we have to look into the different history of technologies. Now I want to explain this a little bit because this is very delicate and um, and important for the historians of technology when they analyze, for example. Um, um, they will say there's always about comparisons. For example, paper making in the, for example, paper making in the 13th century in China is more advanced than in Europe, or a kind of example like this. But for myself, I think that it is uh, well. Of course, we can do this as many people do, but this is not sufficient. I try to show that precisely there could be different histories, and these different histories are not going to be compared according to the advancements of technology, but rather in each technology there is a completely different cosmology or cosmologi cosmological um, um, presuppositions. And it is only by rediscover such a different concepts of technology that we can think how are we going to uh, reappropriate the um, this synchronizing technology, global technology that we have today. Thank you. Um, we'll have time for one more question, but if hey. you make it brief, sorry about keeping Quick you waiting. Uh, so you talk, especially Anna, about uh, corporate uh, um, domination on AI and governments, uh, but do you see maybe another possibility um, since the evolving of computing, grid computing, blockchain, etc., that uh, like it will be that uh, users and individuals will have their own uh, autonomy, like uh, temporary autonomy zone, of, and you will use AI as an open source, etc. Good question. So we have brief responses now because we're running out of time, but please. Very, very brief. Uh, there is no technological solution to a social <coughs> question. 
That's one. Do you, uh, that's a pretty good one. Um, any other comments? I just wanted to make like a very general comment about like uh, um, you know like all uh, of um, this dimension of artificial intelligence and it, how it's usually narrated and fictionalized. I think. Uh, you know, like, uh, we always end up having this uh, discussion uh, and we always end up in these two corners, either uh, technophilic or technophobic, but actually I think there's the dimension which is like this phobof uh, phobophilic dimension that never gets really addressed. And I think that this is really what all the fantasies activate, you know, it's some sort of like seedy and salacious... Uh, um, yeah, uh, strange Lacanian enjoyment. Enjoy your, enjoy your <laughs> AI and so forth. Yeah, it's no. like it's a, a But symptom. one more time, and let's thank our trio of speakers for a wonderful conversation. Thank you.